Hello, I'm David Lister. I'm one of the research managers at Vodafone Group Research and Development. And today I'll be offering my perspectives on Beyond 5G. So this is an exciting industry, it always has been. It's characterized by continuous innovation and delivering services that are an essential part of everybody's lives. And in the few minutes that follow, I want to give a recap of where we are today. Firstly, on our broadband services. I'm going to reflect some of the key technology changes that have already happened, because I think we can learn from that and how that will influence the future. And then I'll be going on to talk about my perspectives of beyond 5G towards 2030 and beyond. So if we just start, first of all, recapping where we are today, mobile broadband growth, which is these bars on this chart, has been growing by an incredible factor, a factor of seven in the last five years. That's a cumulative growth of about 30 to 40% year on year. And whilst that data uh, growth has been increasing, the price that the customer pays has come down by about 85%. Uh, so the, the price that the customer pays per gigabyte is 85% lower in that five year period. Now this has all been enabled because 4G has been a hugely successful technology. It's delivered economies of scale, it's been deployed internationally, it delivers great customer experience. And against this backdrop of continuing demand and capacity and, and continuing demand and growth, we have to look forward to 5G and beyond to work out how we can best deliver, make sure that the industry is sustainable, both environmentally and, and indeed commercially. Now, as well as the capability that we're offering through the 4G service, we've deployed it nationwide. And to date, 97% of houses now have 4G broadband from all operators. And indeed, almost all houses and over 90% of the area is covered by at least one operator. So this gives a fantastic high quality connectivity layer and it forms the foundation for which 5G will be built upon. 5G will extend the performance. It will increase capacity, particularly in urban areas and it supports new services. So I'd like to start with reflecting on some key technology steps and generations in the past. And before I start, I wanted to quote this old Danish proverb, making predictions is difficult especially about the future. And it's particularly relevant to think in our industry where we're trying to forecast 10, 15 years ahead. And I'd like to reflect on the iPhone because the iPhone was such a transformational device and it transformed not just people's interactions with their devices, but the whole industry for, for years, uh, years to come. And on the left, we had Steve Jobs there and he recognized there was an immediate need to, to improve the, the user interface with smartphones existing smartphone devices had fixed uh, keypads, fixed buttons, very inflexible, and a very poor use of space on the handset. So he identified this new clear customer need, consumer need for a new device. When the iPhone was first launched in 2007, it really was quite revolutionary. But even when presented with that future, his counterpart, Steve Balmore, who's the CEO of Microsoft, he said there's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. No chance. And it took many years for him to change his mind and admit that was a mistake. So I think it's just useful just to think about how difficult it is sometimes to, to get the future even remotely correct. Steve Jobs definitely managed it. And he went on to say the iPhone is a revolutionary product, five years ahead of any other mobile phone. And what he was very clever at doing is spotting that it's the user interface. We're all born with the ultimate pointing device of fingers. And the iPhone uses them to create the most revolutionary user interface since the mouse. And with that new user interface, Apple were able to sell its main features, its widescreen iPod for music. They described the, the device being a revolutionary mobile phone and a breakthrough internet communication device. So all about revolution and big changes uh, on the iPhone. Now, as a technologist, looking at the technology components that were introduced, well, maybe it wasn't quite so revolutionary. You know, four of the big features that were advertised was its touchscreen user interface, advanced sensors, edge GSM connectivity, and a two megapixel camera. 
Now, certainly the sensors and the connectivity and the camera they were very good, but they weren't particularly groundbreaking at the time. The thing that really made the difference was the touchscreen interface. And in fact, the touchscreen interface had been patented in 1989, and there's 20 or 30 years of development before the iPhone was launched that enables the, the technology to be matured. And in many ways, and certainly my view, the key thing actually what the iPhone did was it provided a new operating system, a new software uh, platform. And that operating system software platform enabled all the innovation, all the apps and all the widgets and all the new services that other people innovated on and provided, made available to, to the customer. So very largely, in my view, is to do with software and it's to do with building on the technologies, the technology components that indeed other people have already identified. So taking that sort of learning through and just thinking about it from a network perspective, and you know, this is so we can work out where do we go beyond 5G. Again, if we look at how networks have evolved, the transition to 3G to wideband code division multiple access or wideband CDMA was very much based on the learnings that we had from CDMA IS95, a technology that was deployed mainly in the US markets in the 1990s. When 4G came along and we introduced orthogonal frequency division multiple access or PDM, that was very much based on learnings that have been demonstrated and proven through WiMAX, Flash of DM, and DAB broadcasting. And 4G in itself very much forms the foundation for 5G, 5G new radio, which is also built on the same radio physical access layer, OFDM. So there's a clear learning from previous technologies that influence the future. And I think it's equally true, you know, looking beyond 5G, that will be influenced by today's emerging technologies. So to a large degree, wherever we go in the future, we can look around us and say, well, what technologies are starting to emerge today and how will they form that future and, and, um, and help to create that future? And one of the things I think it's worth noting just before we leave the, the generational story is that there is no clear radio access layer alternative to OFDM at this current time. I think that's quite important because that suggests that actually the connectivity layer, the radio access layer, may be coming to a level of maturity that the previous generations didn't, didn't actually have. So when a new generation is discussed, quite often it's the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, that sets the requirements for that next generation of technology. This was the case for 4G with IMT Advanced, and it was the case for 5G called IMT 2020. And the ITU set very ambitious targets and ambitious requirements. For example, they set a requirement of 20 gigabits, 20 gigabit per second on the dial link, a spectrum efficiency three times better than what the previous generation was, and a latency of one millisecond. And these were very ambitious targets, and it set the targets for the 3GPP standards organization to then develop a technology that meets these requirements. And in theory, 5G NR fulfills all these requirements. But in practice, to achieve some of these data rates, for example, 20 gigabits per second, that requires 640 megahertz of downlink spectrum. That's more downlink spectrum than all the mobile operators in a given market has for 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G. And whilst there will be more bandwidth available in higher frequency bands, those higher frequency bands aren't appropriate for nationwide wide area coverage due to propagation limitations. So real world limitations will come into play and restrict the ability to reach some of these most demanding requirements. And those limitations are not just spectrum, but radiated power, it's site density, information theory, non-ideal radio conditions, and commercial reality and economics. So with that background, what do we really want a future technology then to address? Well, these are global technologies with you know, economies of scale for billions of people. So they need to address global challenges. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals is a good starting point. You know, they identify, for, for example, uh, equality, prosperity for all, uh, very mindful of the climate challenge, uh, the carbon and climate challenge that faces, faces us all, so our networks and the way we operate them have to be managed in a carbon-friendly manner. And the services that we introduce 
have to be able to help other people reduce their carbon footprint. We must make sure that the service is cost efficient for both delivering ubiquity of coverage and has a route towards a capacity growth that matches that type of demand that we saw earlier on in the presentation. As we saw with the iPhone, if we can introduce innovative services, if we can introduce a platform that enables other people to introduce innovation, that leads to good customer outcomes, introduces competition, introduces more choice, introduces more innovation, and that gives more likelihood of more features, more services, more advances in both the handset and the network. We should always focus on the prioritization. The customer comes first, whether that customer is a machine or a person, is reflecting what a customer needs is that will lead to a solution that's ultimately going to be successful. So if I can suggest some pointers towards the future, and bearing in mind the caveats at the beginning, it's very difficult to predict 10 or 15 years into the future. But firstly, I think we need to avoid arbitrary technical targets. We put the customer first. We also need to recognize that the spectrum resource is limited. So further changes to the radio access will have diminishing returns. We probably have to build on the spectrum broadly that we have today with some extensions. The emerging technologies of today, I think, will shape the future in 2030. So millimeter wave bands and massive MIMO, they're starting to be deployed in some markets around the world but it's still a relatively immature technology. I think we'll see much more of this in the future as the technology matures, and we'll see new applications and use cases using those frequency bands. There's much higher frequency bands called terahertz, which broadly are around 100 gigahertz or maybe higher. And the thing which appears to be quite exciting about those is that it offers the opportunity for joint sensing and communications, the ability to sense the surrounding environment and to communicate probably to objects in close vicinity to offer new features on the handset. And reflecting the limitations on the availability of spectrum, I think we're going to see a much more uh, creative use of spectrum sharing with licensed and unlicensed spectrum to enable capacity growth to continue to increase in urban environments. But maybe what will dominate everything will be software features particularly the, the world of IT and the world of software, building on the capabilities that we're seeing through machine learning and artificial intelligence. I expect that will form a much more fundamental part of not just how operators run their networks, but also in the types of services that people will come to expect and to be able to use. And aspects that support these capabilities will be built into the network natively. But I think it's reasonable that networks will continue to build upon the concept of network slicing and personalization and edge computing. So taken together, I think these final aspects are much more likely to dominate where a future beyond 5G will actually go. Less to do with hardware and generations of radio access technology, much more dynamic, much more flexible, much more related to software and IT. Now the 5G IC advisory board have produced a vision paper, which I'm very excited about. They set a vision, they set a challenge to imagine, imagine extension of human senses and ambient data. And this reflects actually very well on some of the technologies we mentioned previously, the ability to provide new sensing capability at the handset to sense the environment. And they suggest that you can imagine, you could extend the communication with the perception of being in the same room from where you are to your colleague. You'll be able to speak to others in your own language by the use of real-time translation technologies. And this might be made possible through edge computing type of capabilities that reduce the latency in any, in any delay. And they suggest that you can interact seamlessly with machines and other health and well-being programs. And broadly, to extend the human experience via digital to new sensory perceptions. I think there's quite a creative, quite an ambitious vision that they set out. And it's one I think we can be quite excited about. So if I'd like to just try to wrap up, um, I would suggest that 6G will drive a different approach to what we've had in previous generations of technology. It's very, um, it's less likely to be associated with radio and radio hardware than what the previous generations were. And I think it's more likely to build on the technologies and capabilities that exist today. 
And I think it's the services, the software and the IT that will change. And that may well change the network and the services as profoundly as the operating system for the iPhone and Android have changed the handset. So I like to think the future is exciting and I hope you can join me. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.